Hello, today we're going to be discussing a new case that pits two uh, industry leaders in the uh, entertainment space, Disney and Redbox. Disney, of course, being the producer of uh, iconic motion pictures such as uh, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Frozen, and also being the owner of the Star Wars franchise. Um, the defendant in the case is Redbox. They are the ubiquitous red boxed uh, retailer that sells DVDs outside of grocery stores and fast food restaurants. And for many years, Disney and Redbox have had a pretty contentious relationship. And we'll go into a little bit about the, uh, the background of that relationship. But the current dispute arises out of Redbox's practice of selling digital codes that it obtains from bundle packs of DVDs. And so just very briefly, when Disney uh, sells certain of its DVDs, it sells them as a bundle, and the consumer obtains a DVD physical copy, uh, they obtain a Blu-ray physical copy, and they obtain a code which allows the consumer to go to a website, enter the code, and uh, that gives them access to download a copy of the movie in digital format. Um, what Redbox did and what the um, dispute centers on is uh, it broke up the bundle, it rented the physical DVDs and the Blu-rays, and it then took the codes, which are contained on piece of paper included in the bundle pack, and it sold these pieces of paper, purporting to give consumers the right to download the film that uh, the code is attached to. And the question is whether that uh, practice is legal, and the issue raises uh, a lot of interesting issues involving copyright law, unfair competition, and breach of contract. So before we get into the uh, presentation, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, to my right is Bob Rothstein. He is a partner at Mitchell, Silverberg & Nupp. He is uh, an entertainment lawyer with many years of experience, and when he is not practicing law, he is also an author. He is uh, uh, notably the co-author, along with James Patterson, of the New York Times best-selling anthology uh, story in it, uh, The Family Lawyer. So go check that out. Uh, you can buy it wherever books are sold. Uh, to my left uh, is Devin McRae, who is a partner at Early Sullivan Wright uh, Geyser and McRae. Uh, he uh, is also a litigator uh, who specializes in business litigation, emphasizing entertainment, intellectual property, and employment disputes. And we welcome both to the panel. My name is Aaron Moss. I am a partner at Greenberg Glusker, and I practice in the litigation and intellectual property departments. Okay, so before we get into the issues that are raised by the current lawsuit, Bob, why don't you um, walk us back to the, the history of Redbox and um, the dispute with Disney that arose about a decade ago, because I think it provides some context to uh, the current lawsuit. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Redbox started in the early 2000s. Uh, it was uh, uh, a company before that that sold sundry things uh, based on McDonald's. But in uh, early 2000, uh, it started raining DVDs from uh, kiosks, uh, primarily at supermarkets, grocery stores, for a dollar a day. Um, the problem for some at the time was that um, other stores like Blockbuster, a uh, major video store, would um, charge $3 uh, per day for rental plus membership and late fees. So Redbox uh, said that it uh, wanted to serve cost-conscious families uh, who wanted to watch uh, home videos. Uh, the major motion pictures, um, you know, I looked at that uh, business model and uh, at one point uh, uh, stopped uh, selling uh, 
uh, DV, uh, DVDs to Redbox uh, until at least 28 days after the movie was released on DVD, and that was because the studios worried that their uh, licensing deals with uh, the blockbusters and, and Walmarts of the world would be affected by uh, the less expensive rental rate. Um, Redbox, not surprisingly, objected to this, and in 2008 it sued uh, three of the major studios. Fox, Universal, and Warner over their insistence that Redbox wait for 28 days before uh, Redbox could uh, have uh, recently released DVDs. Uh, these lawsuits proceeded. They were uh, ultimately settled. Uh, uh, the terms, uh, as reported, are, are complicated. I don't think we need to go into it here. But um, the upshot was that six of the seven major studios settled, one didn't, and that was Disney. So uh, Disney, um, uh, after that time, never agreed to sell DVD discs, uh, Blu-ray discs later, to Redbox at all. So Redbox came up with a workaround, um, sort of low-tech, but they would uh, get Disney titles by going to... Uh, uh, retail stores. They'd go to Walmart and uh, they'd go to uh, other retailers and they'd uh, uh, buy Disney discs uh, and rent them. Now, Redbox was entitled to do this under uh, Section 109 of the Copyright Act, uh, known as the First Sale Defense, uh, which says that uh, once uh, someone purchases as the owner of a physical copy, that copy can be resold without recourse by the copyright owner. So that was uh, the backdrop of, uh, of this dispute. Uh, Disney and Redbox were uh, at odds for a long time. And then, uh, as Aaron mentioned, uh, Disney began uh, uh, including in combination packs the right to digital downloads with the advent of the in, in, uh, internet and the ability to download uh, motion pictures. Okay, so Devin, why don't you talk a little bit uh, about uh, a little bit more about the the first sale doctrine and what the contours are of of Section 109? Um, I think you know we we want to try to understand um, why any restrictions that Disney may have wanted to place on the ability of Redbox to purchase. DVDs from third-party stores um, would fail, and then we can segue into the current dispute. Sure. Um, so I, I think most pertinent to that question is is whether uh, title to the physical copy uh, has been passed, and and the question is whether it's if if the person owns the physical copy, the first sale doctrine applies. Uh, if, if the person holding the physical copy is just a licensee uh, and there's a restrictive license on it, then the first sale doctrine would not apply and the copyright owner would be able to control the distribution of the product. Mm -hmm. and, and the first sale doctrine is what allows people to give away uh, movies that they own, records that they own. It allows them to sell them on eBay or at garage sales. And um, importantly, the first sale doctrine only applies to the distribution right under copyright. As, as I'm sure um, most of you know, there are several exclusive rights that are given to copyright owners. They're enumerated in Section 106 of Title 17, and among them are the right to reproduce the work, to create derivative works, to distribute the work. The first sale doctrine allows you, if you buy a physical copy of the work, to transfer that copy. It does not allow you, for example, to make multiple copies of the work and transfer them to your friends. So that's going to become important as we see some of the, um, some of the cases in this area because it is uh, difficult, if not technologically impossible, for motion pictures to be transferred from point, digital motion pictures to be transferred from point A to point B without some reproduction taking place. So um, before we get into the, um, 
uh, into the meat of that uh, argument, let's talk a little bit about the current dispute. So as Bob said, uh, there was no love lost between Disney and Redbox going back for at least a, uh, almost a, a decade now. Um, Disney would not sell Redbox DVDs directly, so Redbox would obtain them in the same way that you and I could, which is to buy them from Walmart or to buy them from distributors that have access to Disney, um, where Redbox didn't. And uh, a couple of years ago, Redbox got the uh, brilliant idea once Disney started to sell these combo packs that I discussed earlier to break them up and to sell and rent them individually. Now, the back of the, um, the package, this is, um, there are a number of different variations, but, but this is one of the, the packages. Uh, it says, uh, this product is authorized for private use only. It is prohibited for any other use and cannot be resold or rented individually. Now, um, I, I think that even Disney would concede that that statement uh, cannot be read to prohibit somebody from exercising his or her right under the first sale doctrine to sell or give away the physical product, even if the physical product is just a piece of the overall bundle. So I think that uh, Disney would concede that somebody could buy this bundle pack and could sell or rent the Blu-ray, could sell or rent the DVD. So the real question is, what about the code? And Redbox began to put these in envelopes, put them in its kiosks, and for about five to eight dollars uh, per code, would sell these pieces of paper to consumers. And that's where Disney uh, objected, and that's where um, our lawsuit begins. So uh, Bob, why don't you um, just walk us through some of the claims that Disney made against Redbox pertaining to its sale of these digital download codes? Uh, well, first, um, uh, Disney um, sued for uh, breach of contract. Uh, Disney uh, argued that the uh, box top language uh, restricting the uh, transfer of codes. Uh, that uh, language uh, was on the cover at least since July of 2017. And also the language that Aaron read was a contract. You can, under the law, have box top contracts. And that both uh, the consumer, but more importantly here, Redbox, agreed to that contract by opening the box. And uh, the fact is that uh, uh, Redbox was familiar with uh, the language and opened many of these boxes, Disney alleged, and so they said that uh, there was a breach of contract on the part of Redbox. Um, Disney also sued for contributory copyright infringement uh, in violation of uh, uh, 17 U.S.C. Uh, section 106. Uh, for contributory infringement, you need a primary infringement, and Disney in the case alleges that when uh, Redbox customers download movies using digital codes purchased from Redbox, they do so without authorization from Disney if they have disposed or don't have, never had in this case, the physical copy. Because uh, there is on the website uh, where consumers download uh, digital movies, uh, a license agreement that uh, the uh, consumer has to agree to. And that license agreement, uh, as Aaron mentioned, says you can't download the digital movie without uh, ownership and possession of the physical copies. So that was the primary infringement, the first element of contributory infringement. And uh, the other elements of contributory infringement are uh, uh, knowledge, 
this case by Redbox of the primary infringement, and certainly uh, Redbox knew what its uh, customers were doing, downloading the movies uh, without having physical possession. That was the entire point of uh, Redbox selling uh, the code separately. And there has to be some sort of material contribution or inducement of the infringement. And uh, Disney alleged that uh, Redbox was inducing infringement by uh, getting its customers to buy the codes and also materially con contributing to the infringement by providing the codes. So that was, those were the two allegations, uh, primary. Uh, Disney also argued there was, uh, uh, on the part of Redbox, tortious interference with Disney's contracts with customers. Uh, Disney alleges that there was this license agreement online and that uh, Redbox was uh, knowingly uh, and intentionally uh, interfering with that contract. And um, Disney also uh, brought various false advertising and unfair competition claims uh, under the code, saying that Redbox commits false advertising by advertising digital movie uh, codes for sale, uh, knowing they can only lawfully be redeemed by customers who own the physical disc. So in a nutshell, that was the uh, allegation. Disney sought a, a damages and a preliminary and permanent injunction prohibiting Redbox from reselling digital movie codes. Okay, so um, in responding to Disney's complaint, Redbox not only um, uh, filed uh, a response to the allegations, but it actually brought its own claims uh, in the form of a counterclaim against uh, Disney. So, Devin, do you want to talk a little bit about what uh, Redbox's defenses were and what its counterclaims were? Sure. So, Redbox is saying that Disney's selling these combo packs, and it, it identifies three things you're getting as part of the combo pack. A, a Blu-ray, a DVD, and a, a, a digital high-definition copy. And it's saying that this is a purchase, it's an outright sale. The, the, the language, the, um, the prescriptive language in, in the fine print is, is not enforceable. And uh, the, the particular language that's kind of been most at issue now in this case is, is whether the language codes are not for sale or transfer. And uh, what Redbox is saying is that uh, Disney uh, cannot enforce that provision uh, because it's violative of the first sale doctrine in that it implicates the owners of these copies to distribute the products in violation of the first sale doctrine. And related to that, it is arguing um, that it's a misuse of copyright for Disney to attempt to enforce that provision because it's violative of the first sale doctrine. And the misuse of copyright doctrine is a, a doctrine that's in place to prevent copyright owners from attempting to leverage their copyright owner into some sort of advantage or beyond the monopoly that copyright grants the, the copyright owner. So what Redbox is doing is it's seeking declaratory relief that the, these uh, prescriptions on the transfer of the codes uh, and the physical products themselves are, are not enforceable. Uh, as a misuse of copyright. Um, it's also seeking a declaration that, that Disney's misused copyright. Um, and then uh, also related is, is going back to the history between Redbox and Disney is, is the fact that uh, Redbox is saying that Disney is, is going out in the marketplace and uh, preventing uh, distributors and retailers from selling to Redbox, uh, which is tortious interference with prospective economic advantage. Um, and then um, Redbox, this is related to the, the copyright misuse claim and the dec declaratory relief claim that by a, a putting these uh, prescriptions on the box uh, that it's committing false advertising. Disney is committing false advertising because it's telling the consumers in the marketplace uh, that it can't do certain things that it can in fact do. Um, so it, it's seeking uh, the right to continue doing what it's doing with these Redbox kiosks, including the sale of these digital codes. Um, and, and damages for tortious interference with uh, prospective economic advantage. Got it. Okay. So let's let's uh, explore um, a couple of these arguments in a little more depth. So, uh, first question, Bob, is would Disney object if somebody that purchases this copy decides to sell on eBay 
each component, the DVD, the Blu-ray, and the piece of paper that has uh, the code. Separately? Uh, all together. All together. All together. Yeah. All together. Um, you know, I, I, I don't speak for Disney, and so I, I don't know uh, what Disney's done. I do know, however, that there have not been uh, uh, lawsuits against consumers uh, that uh, challenge that kind of conduct. So uh, uh, that that's probably revealing. And I, I'll also say that I think very often, uh, and that's what uh, the contributory infringement doctrine is also uh, used for, the, the, the concept that someone can be sued for contributory infringement. And that is that if uh, uh, an entity is encouraging widespread copyright infringement, that entity is the one that should pay for it. So um, I, I don't uh, know uh, of uh, any situation in which uh, anyone's going after the consumer. I will say if you're only talking about the physical uh, uh, property, uh, that probably is protected by the first sale doctrine as, no one is, as long as no one is uh, exercising uh, the reproduction uh, right from a copyright standpoint. Uh, as I said, from a contract standpoint, it's debatable. It might technically be a breach of the, uh, the box top contract, but uh, no one uh, has enforced uh, any such rights or purported to against consumers. So uh, I should have said this at the top, but um, uh, none of us are involved in the dispute um, as lawyers for either Redbox or Disney. and. All of the views that we may express today are uh, purely our own. They do not reflect the views of any of our clients or our respective law firms. Um, so the interesting um, uh, issue in terms of trying to understand uh, kind of the contours of Disney's argument is that if you, you look at the back of the box, it specifically says that the prohibition is that the product can't be resold or rented individually. That seems to suggest that Disney would not object to having this sold altogether as one uh, product. That being said, the code itself says that it's not for sale or transfer, and so the question is, if you sell the entirety of the bundle, you're necessarily also selling the code. And so if, in fact, the code can't be transferred, aren't you, at that point, only selling really certain components of the product, which is exactly what Disney says it doesn't want you to do? So. Uh, I don't know if, if Disney's argument would be that you can transfer the entire product, but the actual code is not going to be valid um, in the hands of a new user. Uh, it's a little bit unclear to me what what its argument is. Well, yeah, Aaron, I, I again, put, putting aside its argument, I think what's really going on here, I think, is this. Uh, Disney also sells uh, DVD, Blu-ray, and digital downloads uh, separately. But if uh, the consumer buys each one separately, they have to pay more than they pay for the combo pack. Um, so I really do think what's going on is that what Disney or, or any you know, company in this situation is concerned about is the resale of the, uh, uh, the code, the, you know, allowing someone to have a digital download because it defeats the purpose of, of a discount. Uh, any consumer can go and buy the movie digitally. So I think that the focus really is on the code. If you take the, the, the DVD and Blu-ray and give it to one person, and you take the code and give it to another person, really unfair to Disney, who is making this available to the consumer at a, a lesser price uh, because it's a three-in-one. And splitting it up defeats the purpose of that discount. So I think really... Uh, looking at the contract logically and, and, and uh, through the goals of Disney, the prohibition is splitting up the uh, physical property with the uh, 
w with the code that allows one to uh, reproduce the digital property. Okay, so let's let's uh, Devin. I want to. Well, oh, if I'm I may, sorry, I'd like yeah. to go back to your question uh, about whether Disney would object yeah. to the uh, sale of the entire combo pack on eBay. And I think the answer is yes, as, as we all know that uh, Disney's brought a motion for a preliminary injunction uh, seeking to prevent Redbox from doing what it's doing. And uh, in, in th that context, uh, Disney has had to come forward with a very particular interpretation of, of its purported agreement. And um, one of the things is, is because the codes, the, the language codes are not for sale or transfer, applies to the codes that that would, even though uh, ordinarily the physical products would be able to be transferred pursuant to the first sale doctrine, but because the codes are in there, that it would be a violation of the contract. And, and sort of when pinned down by the judge, uh, Disney uh, admitted that, well, no, that under our interpretation of the contract, if a mother bought this as a gift for a child, that would be a violation of the contract. And then it says, well, but we wouldn't enforce. But wouldn't, wouldn't that be a, a, basically a roadmap to uh, drive a, a hole through the first sale doctrine? All uh, a copyright owner would have to do is put in a code, even if the code didn't have any uh, inherent value, and say the code can't be transferred and thereby uh, prevent the transfer of the, uh, of the physical copy. Isn't, isn't that... Um, exactly what the first sale doctrine is designed to prevent? Well, no, let, let's, let's go back, first of all, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> I take Devin's point, but let's look at what Disney really has done. They've only sued over the individual uh, transfer of the codes, Red, Redbox uh, opening this combo pack and suing the codes individually, which clearly competes with downloads from iTunes. These are not people who are getting these individual codes uh, uh, you know they're not they're not getting these individual codes and and uh, and also the the combo packs. It's Redbox who's who's doing this. So that's what Disney's focusing on. But the answer to whether or not um, uh, the uh, including a code in the box uh, drives uh, a hole into the first sale defense. And by the way, I prefer to call it a defense. It's affirmative defense under Section 109. The rights are under, of copyright are under 106. But, you know, putting, putting that uh, aside, um, the, as, as Aaron mentioned, the first sale defense doesn't apply to the right of reproduction. And what this code does is allow access to uh, the reproduction of uh, a digital uh, copy, which is licensed. So, uh, the, the first sale defense doesn't apply to that at, at all, the digital download, and that's what we're talking about. So no one's prohibiting anybody from disposing uh, uh, of, the, of the physical disks. The consumer can still do that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's focus then on the, uh, on the codes. We'll assume that for the moment uh, Disney is not uh, objecting to the transfer of the, the disks and is not using the presence of the code in order to do that. Um, so as Bob alluded to, if you go on uh, iTunes or another service that uh, sells or, or um, uh, licenses digital copies of films, they can cost upwards of fifteen twenty dollars. Uh, as I understand it, Redbox is selling these codes which gives the consumer access to the same digital movie for six or seven dollars. Uh, the question is why is that, um, why should that be allowed when the money is going directly into Redbox's pocket and Disney is not making a sale, a fifteen or twenty dollar sale that it might otherwise have made? Well, Disney chose to place in the marketplace the combo packs and, and Redbox is a lawful purchaser and then so the question that begs the question uh, when it sells the code what is it selling um, and, and Redbox has taken the position that uh, it's selling a copy and that it owns a copy as demonstrated by the code and Redbox says look you look at the package it says you get a blu-ray a DVD and a digital high-definition copy and what you don't see on the package is this restrictive license um, that uh, Bob was talking about 
And so after you buy this, and, and, and it really shouldn't matter whether it's Redbox or mom and pop purchasing this, uh, the question uh, about whether there's a restrictive license on the use of the code uh, applies to anybody that's purchasing it. And so when you buy this, you, you don't know it's subject to a restrictive license. Um, Disney says you do by the, by the fine print here, the codes are not for sale or transfer. But in, in fact, you, you don't know the terms of the license until you actually buy the package, open the package, and then attempt to redeem the code. And that's at, uh, and on these uh, Disney websites or their, their affiliates websites where you can redeem the digital copy of the movie, that's where the restrictive license is. And so uh, that's when you're informed for the first time that you're not owner of a, of a digital copy, a uh, high definition copy of the movie, but it's just a license. Well, let, let's put, let's put aside the, the, the license for a minute because I want to I want to make sure that we understand what the um, uh, what the contours of, of, of the claim is. If you, let's assume, and there's no license restriction, uh, have the right to resell this code. As Bob said, it's the first sale doctrine pertains to the distribution of the physical item. Well, isn't the physical item here a piece of paper that has a code printed on it? And why would the first sale doctrine extend to affirmatively require Disney to provide access to the film that's attached to the code? Well, so I, I think the answer to that really is when the purchaser purchases it, it doesn't know that that's what it's buying. It could believe that it's buying an actual copy, a digital copy. And so, you know, the fact that the, the code itself, uh, one of the issues that, that, that's being litigated and that was addressed uh, in, in the court's order on the motion for preliminary injunction is whether or not uh, the code is a copy. So, Bob, what, what, is, um, what is Disney's position with regard to what exactly the consumer uh, is entitled to if uh, that consumer is not the original purchaser? Okay, well, um, let, me, let me go back to, to one point that Devin made first. Um, let's keep in mind that it's Redbox that is opening up and repackaging these individual codes and, and selling them. I don't think there's any question that Redbox knows that uh, uh, on the website to redeem this code that there is a license, a restrictive license agreement. So if the consumer isn't aware of that, as I, I would agree with Disney that that should be the false advertising, unfair competition uh, claim against Redbox. It's Redbox who's really packaging the individual codes and, and, uh, and not telling the consumer, if the consumer is unaware, what's going on. Also, the consumer does know in advance uh, that uh, uh, they need to uh, agree to the terms and uh, they see that they don't have the, the physical copy. Uh, so uh, again, I would argue that's uh, uh, copyright infringement and the fact that um, uh, Redbox is packaging this code individually and, and, and not uh, telling anyone uh, is, uh, is contributory infringement. Um, so, I mean, I think- Well, isn't Disney, it only I, I, contributory infringement if the, um, if the, the consumer is infringing in the first instance? By, by downloading a movie attached to the code. Um, does, does the consumer have the right to do that? If, if the consumer is in physical possession of this, having bought it from Redbox? Well, if the consumer, uh, physical possession of the uh, code, the answer is no. Um, there's no first sale uh, defense to uh, a reproduction. Uh, to, to an unlawful reproduction, and that's what they're doing. The, the uh, first sale defense only applies to copies, as that is defined uh, under Section 101 of the Copyright Act. And copies uh, are uh, uh, basically the physical medium on which the work, in this case the movie, is embodied. And you can't take this piece of paper and 
put it in your Blu-ray player and generate a movie. You can't put it in anything and, and generate a movie. So the, the, the code, the piece of paper, is not a copy. And therefore, the first sale doctrine doesn't apply, and consumers who download the movie without being in own, uh, possession and owning the, the physical goods are indeed copyright infringers. Devin, do you well, agree with that? Well, l let me take a step back. Yeah. So Disney's theory of, of liability for the primary infringer is that these individuals have purchased the code. Uh, they only have the code. So they don't have the Blu-ray or the DVD that, that went along with the code. And so when the purchaser goes on to Movies Anywhere or the other website to redeem the, uh, a download of the digital code, they're presented with a restrictive license. And uh, as a condition of that license to download this, um, to download a copy uh, of, of the movie on their hard drive or device, uh, they have to represent and warrant that they're, they are in possession of the physical products that accompanied the code. And Disney says that's the, the Blu-ray and the DVD. So when that consumer makes that representation and it's not true, they have violated the terms of the license and therefore have committed infringement. Well, do you believe that the consumer that purchases a code from Redbox has an affirmative right to download the code free of any restrictions? Well, th so that's what, what is precisely at issue in, in the case. And, and, and the, two, the two sort of primary questions that the, the court has been struggling with now is, is one, um, is it a copy and is the code protected uh, by uh, the, the first sale doctrine? And on that question, the court has, has um, said, with respect to the first sale doctrine, uh, that, it, that it's not a copy, that the code is not a copy. There was precedent for that um, in a case from the Second Circuit where this was a mu it involved music sharing, and uh, it was set up so that you could sell your digital copies of songs online. And the, the company had taken steps to make sure that, with its software, that if, if you sold a copy, of the song, it would be eliminated from your hard drive and go somewhere else. And so that there, there wasn't, you know, multiple copies. And, and so that was the way they were trying to say there was no infringement of the right of uh, reproduction there. And this is just distribution of a digital copy. And, and the court was technical about it and said, no, uh, it, it's, it's not distribution because when you do this, scientifically, you are making a copy and you are reproducing a copy, which by definition uh, would violate, uh, it would not be subject to the first sale doctrine. And in addition to that, there was a report from the United States Copyright Office uh, that was prepared at the, at the request of Congress about uh, uh, making digital files uh, or including them um, as copies or, or, or within the, the, the protection of the, of the first sale doctrine. And, and the report concluded that, that it shouldn't um, because digital files don't degrade over time, and uh, which means that, you know, the kind of the thinking behind that was, well, if you have a, a used copy of something over time, it's going to degrade. It's not going to really uh, affect the market for the sale of new copies of, of the work. And uh, so there were some some items that, based on the differences between um, digital files, it would have more of an impact on the market for the actual copyright owner. Okay, but, but, but hold on. If, if, if I understand uh, what you're saying correctly, um, the first sale doctrine does not uh, affirmatively give the purchaser from Redbox the right to download the film, which would be um, done by the creation of a, of a copy that implicates the reproduction right. If that's the case, if there's no affirmative right to get the movie, then why shouldn't Disney be able to put restrictions? In other words, if Disney says, we will actually give you the right to download it, even though you're the secondary purchaser, so long as you've also acquired the physical. In other words, aren't consumers better off having some chance to be able to download the, the, the work, whereas um, if, if they didn't have uh, these restrictions, they wouldn't have any right to download it? If, if they didn't have any restrictions, they wouldn't have any. Well, it, In it other words, if the first sale doctrine doesn't apply, then there's no, um, there's no, uh, there's no right to download it in the first place. Well, in some sense, the first sale doctrine 
uh, does apply because the proscription on uh, transferring this stuff individually on its face would also apply to the physical copies. And so Disney has conceded that, well, yeah, you're right. We, we, we probably couldn't say you can't sell the DVD individually or the Blu-ray individually. And, and then there's also a question of it, it, when you purchase the package, what are you buying? Because it's not clear that you're getting a, a, an option to download a digital copy that's subject to uh, terms and conditions, which also include that you don't dispose of, of your physical copies of the Blu-ray and the DVD. So uh, what, what that implicates is, is the misuse doctrine which uh, prescribes copyright owners from uh, using their mon uh, copyright monopoly to, to, to get some advantage in the marketplace that copyright doesn't give them. And here what they're doing is they're requiring the consumer to forego uh, their rights to distribute the Blu-ray copy and the DVD uh, in order to download a digital copy that they've already paid for. Bob, is that copyright misuse? Uh, uh, it is not copyright uh, misuse. Um, uh, copyright misuse is uh, a, a defense that's rarely, uh, but occasionally, recognized uh, under the law. Um, David Nimmer, uh, in his treatise, gives uh, examples of, of when the issue arises, not always misuse, but requiring exclusive maintenance uh, of a computer. Uh, basically, when you maintain a computer, software has to be loaded, and, and uh, uh, some companies uh, uh, said, you, you got to use us for maintenance. Uh, you, uh, forbidding reverse engineering is when the, the defenses arrive. Trying to control expression, stopping other people from engaging in expression by using your copyright. Uh, uh, or a pending minor expression in a larger product. I believe the, the Mega Aaron's, Aaron's case uh, involving the use of a very small copyrighted work to stop the importation of a, uh, of, of a good. But the copyright uh, misuse defense has never been recognized in a case like this where all the uh, plaintiff is trying to do is to uh, protect its uh, uh, copyright uh, in, in the work at issue. Here there's no misuse uh, for another reason, and that is that um, no one is, is uh, uh, really trying to stop, Disney hasn't sued anyone from, uh, anyone from disposing of the physical goods. All Disney is doing is saying, we're going to give you this added benefit the right re to reproduce, but we don't want you to, to, to hurt our business model by giving it away to, to someone else. And the law has consistently recognized uh, the right of the copyright holder to do that. And, and in fact, copyright misuse is, is uh, a defense designed to, uh, you know, pr uh, to, to prevent someone from acting antithetical to the Copyright Act. That is, you know, the Copyright Act is supposed to increase the availability of, of copyrighted works. Here, Disney's business model does that. It lets people get a digital copy. They can give several copies to their family, et cetera. So to call this copyright misuse is you know, contrary to the law and the policy. Now, when you said a moment ago that Disney is simply trying to enforce its rights in the work, is the work in this context the code? Is it the physical disks? Is it both? But what, what I meant was actually it's uh, Disney is granting a right of uh, reproduction in the work, which is the movie. The, the digital download uh, is, is, is a reproduction of the, the particular movie. And um, the, the cases have held that um, uh, there is a right to, um, uh, to put restrictions on a license uh, of a copyright holder's uh, reproduction right. A, a court involving Apple uh, said courts have long held that copyright owners may also use their limited monopoly to leverage the right to use their work on the acceptance of specific conditions. So Disney's leveraging the right uh, uh, of reproduction uh, correctly, uh, it just has specific conditions. 
Anybody can dispose of those, they just, uh, those physical uh, properties under the first sale defense. What they just can't do is uh, reproduce uh, the, uh, the digital download. Okay, so, so spoiler alert, uh, the judge in the Disney Red Box case denied Disney's request to preliminarily enjoin uh, Red Box. Um, the judge did not uh, find that there was a first sale issue implicated, but did find copyright misuse. Um, did the judge reject the theory that Bob just laid out, um, or was that based on a different theory? And, and what was the uh, what was the reasoning? Well, I I think uh, what Bob just laid out uh, is not. Uh, Precisely in line with 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 the way that, that that Disney did this, or the way that Disney communicated the restrictive license, and so I think part and parcel of uh, the judge's analysis in this case uh, started with um, the contract claim. What what did Disney tell consumers, uh, including Redbox, uh, what they were getting uh, when when they purchased this combo pack? And uh, the, the terms of the license are, are not on the box. Um, and and they're, th again, those are in the, um, on, on the license, or sorry, in the websites when you go to actually download the copy uh, or download the digital high definition copy, that's when you see that there's this restriction. Um, and so uh, Disney has language on, on the top of it, its box that it concedes is at least partially not enforceable. Um, and so uh, what the judge is saying under these circumstances uh, are, you know, it's, 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 it, you don't have a contract on the top of your box. And so people are purchasing this thing and, and, and they haven't assented to the terms and conditions that you're placing on the download when you buy, when you buy the box. You're, you haven't consented. There wasn't enough for assent. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, to then say, well, after you've bought this and you want to go redeem your code, you, you find out that as part of that, you're supposed to uh, sign away your right uh, under the first sale doctrine to dispose of the physical copies, which are the, the DVD and Blu-ray. So I think when you take that all together, uh, the court is saying that that's a misuse in copyright, that there's some overreaching by the copyright owner here to gain some sort of advantage that wouldn't be available in the monopoly okay, of copyright. Okay, but, but why should Disney have to put uh, a, a small print boilerplate contract on the box when it doesn't have the, uh, the obligation to give consumers a reproduction right in the first place. In other words, um, that's not something that consumers could ever hope to get unless Disney affirmatively granted it. Is that correct? Well, well that's fair to say. They don't, they don't have to give up a reproduction right, but the question is what are they giving up when the consumer buys this and, and they see on the box Blu-ray, DVD, digital high definition? And so what is it you're getting? So if you're only getting a license to download the digital copy that's subject to certain terms and conditions, the consumer should be aware of it at the time of purchase. That's part and parcel, or that, that's a driving factor of what uh, the ruling is here on misuse, is that you, you have to be clear. And so Disney, Disney said, look, um, our, our language codes are not for sale or transfer. Uh, that was the language that it really focused on. Uh, it said it, it, it's it's a it's a box top um, it's a box top contract it's a box top license it puts them on notice and and by opening the package Redbox and other consumers know that there are restrictions that are going to apply and and but if you look at the at the case it said it was it was looking at a case called Lexmark uh, Arizona Cartridge Remanufacturers Association versus Lexmark and it said you know we're like that case uh, Your Honor uh, but on, in that case, the, the license at issue on the top of the box said, please read before opening. Opening of this package or using the patented cartridge inside confirms your acceptance of the following license agreement. The patented cartridge is sold at a special price 
subject to restriction that it may be used only once. Following this initial use, you, you agree to return the empty cartridge only to Lexmark for remanufacturing and recycling. If you don't accept these terms, return the unopened package to your point of purchase. A regular price cartridge without these terms is available. So there, what, what the court here is saying is that, that that was valid because it gave notice of the license, it set forth the terms of the conditions of the sale of the licenses, it, it afforded the consumer the opportunity to read the terms of the contract before deciding to accept them, and provided consideration in the form of a reduced price. And it also described a post-purchase mechanism for rejecting the license. So there, it, it was said, that there was enough that all of that together led to the conclusion that the consumer when they open the package they've accepted the contract and here you can't say that because the court said the language on this box is not enough to do all that so bob is that right does this case really come down to what language is being used on the box does it rise or fall on on the particular words well um i, I think um uh, and I, I understand the Devin's argument uh, the in description because the order isn't clear, but I think uh, it needs to be broken down. Uh, the court did uh, hold that um, uh, there was no contract, that as, as Devin said, that the um, uh, language was not enough to give rise to the contract. We can pass that. I, I, I disagree with that. I think this case was like the Lexmark case, but uh, uh, I don't think we have uh, the remaining time, uh, enough time to talk about that. Um, I read uh, the misuse, and I understand what Devin's saying, but I read the misuse the, this, uh, part, part of the decision uh, a little more broadly. I don't think the judge was relying on the contract language. I think, uh, unfortunately, he was holding that uh, Disney engaged in copyright misuse merely by uh, uh, putting in the restriction on the website license that when you, the consumer uh, uh, downloaded the uh, the digital copy that the consumer also had to own and be in possession of the of, of the physical copy and again that's that's as I mentioned before broader than any court has ever gone and antithetical to the purposes of copyright because I don't know what Disney will do if anything but one thing it could do was say we're not gonna we're not gonna have combo packs with uh, digital downloads anymore because people are selling them and undercutting our other business. And if that's the case, then the consumer is deprived of access, not, uh, not, not uh, in a situation where uh, there, there's more access. So that's why there's no copyright misuse at all. But, but I think the judge's decision is broader. It's certainly debatable cause, because I don't find it clear. So is the judge then, in your opinion, saying that because Disney is attempting to restrict the terms on which somebody can download the digital copy, that that is copyright misuse? I think what he's saying, I think he's confused. He's reading the, the language that says, if you own, uh, if, if you're exercising the reproduction right, you have to own the physical goods as a restriction on the first sale defense. It's not. Anyone can sell their, uh, their physical copies. Uh, what that language is, is a, a condition of the right to reproduce the, the, the copyrighted work, and that's perfectly fine. No one has to do that. And again, if people want to uh, own the digital download uh, alone, they can that that's there too. They can pay for it separately. So I think the, the judge has it backwards. Give us your interpretation of the order on misuse. But before we, we do that, let's just back up and, and uh, try to understand the full scope of, of the order. On the breach of contract claim, what did the judge hold with respect to um, the assertion by Disney that Redbox is violating uh, the terms? So uh, I previously mentioned Lexmark and, and, and really the way that uh, the court framed the question on the contract was whether the language on the combo packs stating that, quote, codes are not for sale or transfer, end quote, is like the box top license in Lexmark and thus an enforceable license. And then whether Redbox decision to open the combo pack packaging, notwithstanding that language, constitutes 
acceptance of that license. And so that was the question, and, and the court said that Disney had failed to, to establish a likelihood of success on the merits uh, on that particular question uh, because it found the language on uh, Disney's packaging to fall well short of uh, the, 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 the language that's, that's required to, to make that conclusion. So this is uh, an issue of not having the right words on the package that a consumer could at least ostensibly see before he or she buys it. Yes, and, and I think that that particular issue, the packaging and what Disney communicates on the uh, packaging is driving the entirety of the decision here. Well, so then isn't this uh, a simple fix for, for Disney if, uh, if Disney puts the appropriate language and says that by opening the package you are accepting the terms, namely X, Y, and Z, uh, your reading is at that point uh, the case, uh, if, if Redbox were to continue its practice, goes in Disney's favor? It, it could be, and then that depends on the scope of the misuse finding. Um, because as I read the opinion, in the misuse finding, I think the judge clearly ties it to the fact that the terms of this restrictive license are not known until after purchase and until you go to redeem something you thought you already owned. And, and I think that, at least to some degree, played a big part in the finding of misuse. So, but then you pose the question, well, let's say uh, we put everything, or Disney put everything on the package and the restrictive license was clear, it, it satisfied all the Lexmark indicia, and, and anybody that opened that package knew, knew that if, if they were gonna redeem the code, they could not uh, distribute the physical copies of the Blu-ray or the DVD, uh, which would otherwise be uh, entirely permissible under the first sale doctrine. And, and so, you know, Bob's saying he's reading the order as saying that the court is saying, uh, you can never do that. You can, you can never restrict the uh, you know, owner's right to distribute particular copies. And I'm not sure about that. Uh, on the other hand, I, I don't, I, it is a little, there is a little bit of ambiguity there, so it, it's hard to determine which way this particular court uh, would, would rule um, if, um, if, if all the language was on the package and it was known at the outset. So, so Bob, let me ask you, if, if, if the language at the outset, outset said, um, if you buy this combo pack, you need to agree uh, to restrictions, namely that you will um, retain possession and ownership of the physical copies at all time if you want to be able to take advantage of the downloading. Uh, would that be permissible or would that be copyright misuse because the, uh, the, the plaintiff is attempting to condition um, the right to the download on the consumer giving up something that he or she would otherwise have the right to do, namely to transfer the physical copy? Um, it, it would be permissible to use that language and it would not be copyright misuse and in my opinion uh, what Disney's doing is by no stretch of the imagination copyright misuse now the judge just got it wrong again it's not any restriction on transfer it's a con the language is a condition on the right to reproduce and courts could have consistently uh, uh, upheld that uh, there's a uh, a case called Video Pipeline where I believe um, uh, the uh, uh, Disney conditioned uh, use of their clips on the website not saying anything negative about Disney and that was upheld uh, and that involved arguably uh, uh, speech and it, it, so uh, I think it should follow that what Disney is doing here is is Again, by no stretch of the imagination, copyright misuse. So what would be um, the best way for Disney to right the ship on, on appeal? What do you think, that, what, what argument do you think would, would carry the most weight with an appellate court? Well, I mean, I think on appeal, to me, the um, uh, contributory infringement uh, uh, should be clear, and actually, if um, if uh, the judge's uh, decision on 
that issue stands, uh, I think if Disney wins on the misuse, then Redbox will be liable for copyright infringement. Uh, whether they have to write, Disney has to write the ship on, on the, the contract issue, I, I think is somewhat more complex. As I mentioned, I believe that the contract uh, is like the Lexmark case that Devin mentioned. Uh, consumers and Redbox know if they open this box, they can't take out the individual uh, uh, code and sell it, but uh, certainly language uh, language can always be tweaked, and uh, uh, companies in the entertainment industry and outside have done that all the time, even when the, there aren't lawsuits. But I do think that what's heartening for Disney is that uh, uh, the judge, uh, Judge Pragerson, did find that the first sale defense did not apply to digital downloads, and I think the uh, misuse decision is such an outlier that uh, Disney will, at least for copyright infringement, uh, uh, has a very high chance of prevailing on it. Now, Devin, do you think that the, the judge got it wrong in holding that the first sale doctrine uh, did not apply to the download codes? I, I think in light of the Second Circuit decision in, in Redigi, which pretty much squarely addressed this issue, um, and based on rules of statutory interpretation, um, along with the uh, United States Copyright Office report, it, it would be pretty difficult to find or conclude that uh, a digital copy is subject to the first sale doctrine. And so I, I think the court was constrained to, to make that finding, but uh, very clearly noted that, that that finding was not necessary for the outcome in this particular decision. Um, and uh, also noted that, well, there, there are other issues. And, and it go, again, it goes back to the packaging and what was communicated to uh, the consumers about whether, um, you know, consumers actually believe they were buying a copy, notwithstanding the fact that digital, digital copies are not subject to the first sale doctrine uh, as, as particular copies under the statute. Um, but there, there were times, uh, uh, where at the hearing on the preliminary injunction, the, 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 the judge and, and, and you or I or anybody else might sit there and think, hmm, you know, I look at this, I look at the package, it says I'm getting a digital high definition copy. So, you know, is the code uh, a copy equivalent? I think that term was, was, was used. And, um, but when you, once you look at the case and, uh, you know, the congressional report, it, it's hard to come out the other way. Um, so it, it probably would have been a, a uh, much more of an outlier had he found that it was a particular copy. On the misuse question, though, I think, uh, you know, if you're Redbox uh, defending the appeal, uh, you're, you're saying this is the particular facts of this case. There, there, it wasn't necessary for the judge to find that you could never contract your rights away under 109. The problem here was that Disney had language that it's seeking to enforce that at the outset it admitted was not enforceable with respect to two thirds of the products sold. Well, so so uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about what Bob thought would be the lead uh, argument on appeal, assuming that misuse um, is, is incorrect, and that is contributory infringement. So, in light of the language that exists uh, on the package. Is there contributory infringement here on Redbox's part? It, with under the present Correct. language, no. I think the judge got it right. That that and and what's the the reason in your opinion that there's no contributory infringement? Uh, because um, the, I think there's misuse here. Okay, but 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 if 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 the consumer um, downloads the if, if start over. There's only contributory infringement if the consumer's act of downloading the film is a primary infringement. Correct. So the question is, if Disney has the right to restrict the reproduction of its works, and it exercises that right, and therefore a consumer that downloads the work without being the original purchaser uh, does that in you know excess of 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 its rights? Why isn't Redbox liable for that? 
because uh, Disney didn't adequately notify the consumer or the purchaser of the product of, 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 of those limitations on the rights. Do you, do you agree? With well, me? I don't because let's remember how the consumer is getting this red box is repackaging uh, this material. They have knowledge of uh, what's on the website and it's Redbox really who's providing these individual uh, uh, codes to the consumer in Redbox packaging. Um, so uh, that, that's an issue that the, the court really uh, didn't focus on and, and should have. Okay, well, um, either of you have predictions for what's, uh, what's next for the case? Uh, I, you know, without, I, I assume that the, uh, the case will uh, uh, proceed possibly to summary judgment. I don't know if this is a case that will be certified uh, for, uh, they call an interlocutory, interlocutory and interim appeal. Uh, it seems like it should be. And the Ninth Circuit has taken similar copyright cases, so maybe they'll, uh, the uh, parties will try to go to the appellate court at this stage. Um, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. And, and, and do you agree and do you think that uh, if, if the court does uh, allow an interlocutory appeal that the misuse ruling stands? I think under these circumstances, the misuse ruling uh, would stand. In it, but if I'm Disney, I would definitely want to take this up to appeal right away because the based on the on the judge's ruling in the preliminary injunction motion it's pretty clear uh, it's certainly not going to win any sort of partial summary judgment and most of the legal issues are going to go against it presumably it put forward its best evidence in, in, in trying to get this preliminary injunction and and the the judge had some footnotes too about how to address the other claims um, and so it, it's pretty clear uh, the, how the case goes forward if, if, if it remains at the trial court level. So let's talk a, a little bit in, in the remaining couple minutes we have. Um, if, if there are um, content owners that are watching this and they're saying to themselves, I, I don't want to be in a situation where, uh, where I'm caught up in a litigation having to try to enforce my rights, what is uh, a way that, uh, or is there a way that Disney could have conducted itself, either through language or otherwise, that would have prevented the Redbox consumer from downloading these codes or having a right to? Well, um, I, I suppose that um, if, if one assumes that uh, the, the judge was correct, and I think he was incorrect, but certainly on the contract, I, I agree with uh, Devin that uh, the uh, content provider can get closer to the Lexmark language, and probably the magic words are, by opening this box, you agree that. Uh, I don't think that was necessary, it was obvious, but uh, adding that language, if you buy uh, arguendo, Judge Prager's opinion would help on a, on a contract claim um, versus, a, versus a, a red box. Is, and, and again, we you know, had different readings of the judge's opinion, but I don't think there's anything anyone can do about the misuse argument except try to persuade the judge to change his mind or appeal. And, and Devin, just f finally, um, if the language was changed, um, as, as Bob suggested, does that then take Redbox out of the code selling business? It, it possibly could. I, I think that was a, a, a very large part of, again, what was driving the decision here. And, and, and when Judge Pregerson talked at the hearing about what he was really thinking about is, is how do I, you know, uh, allow certainty in the marketplace? How do I make sure that copyright owners are, are, are granted all of their rights and, and, and nobody infringes upon those? Uh, but I also want to be make sure they don't get sloppy in, in the way that they market their materials and, 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 and uh, identify exactly uh, what, what they were doing. So I, again, I think the language on the box was at the heart of the ruling. And if, if the box said Blu-ray plus DVD, Plus, we'll give you an option to download a digital copy subject to the conditions that you don't dispose of the Blu-ray and the DVD. 
uh, we might be having an entirely different discussion right now. I'm not sure all that would fit on the top, but, um, but we will see if they adopt your suggestion. All right, I think we're done. Um, thank you for joining us, and uh, contact information, I believe, will be provided if, uh, if there's any further questions.